going to have a chair choir, chair three selections with you this morning. We're going to do something a little different. You'll notice the three selections in your bulletin, and the last one is soon and very soon. We're going to sing that, but on the last verse, we invite the entire congregation to join us on that. And that's just going to be a repeat of the first verse. So, if y'all think about it, feel free to join in and clap if you like. So, hope you enjoy. Once we're done, uh, your chair will come to join you in the crowd. So after we're, uh, uh, after we're done, if you don't mind standing up so they can see where you are to join you, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. 
starting us off this morning. We're going to hear from all of our children of all shapes and sizes, and they are they're going to play for us and sing for us. Be a wonderful service. Glad that you are here today. Glad to be with you. Glad to be back in town. I was at a meeting last week of large church pastors, not not large church pa pastors of large churches. Uh, Bob Rambo was there. Actually, Bob Rambo and Stacy Parvin were both there. And Bob, you may or not heard this, but Bob is going to be appointed in, in June as the pastor of Christ Church in Jackson, which is still the largest Methodist church in Mississippi. So that's pretty exciting. And we'll wish Bob well. But enjoyed being with them. Enjoyed the things you learn at a workshop. But uh, enjoyed kind of we, we being competitive people, which we all are. We always line our churches up against other people's churches. And this church does pretty well and especially in children and music. There, there's just no way. The, there, there are much larger churches that don't have as good a music and as wonderful children as we have. But thank you for everything you do to make this church right. Our, we will have more music tonight. Our six o'clock service tonight will be our brass ensemble doing their end of the year concert. And then there will be a barbecue dinner after that. You can come and eat for a donation after that with service tonight at six and uh, dinner afterwards. Uh, this afternoon at 1.30, we have a shower and tea uh, for uh, Hunter Upton's bride-to-be, Keaton. Keaton will be a member of our church family very, very soon. And many of y'all have not had a chance to get to meet her yet. So we're having this tea this afternoon, 1.30 in the fellowship hall, and hope that you can drop by. Also happening this week is an older adult luncheon, uh, Tuesday at 11.30, and we'll talk about some of our trips we're going to plan for the coming year. A lot going on in the life of the church. Glad that you are here. Glad to have all these wonderful children and appreciate the visitors and grandparents who've come to see them. Please take note of the other items that are in your church bulletin. And please sign the attendance pads that we have in the pews that we might have a record of you being here. Before we go on to the end of the service, we will turn it over to the sixth grade girls.
Let's continue in worship as we take our bulletins and turn to our call to worship. Let's stand, please, as we read. The... <laughs> Praise the Lord from the earth, kings of the earth and all nations. You princes and all rulers on earth, young men. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for His name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. Most gracious Heavenly Father, through the voices of children, through the voices of adults, we praise You today. Bless this service. We have come in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Our hymn is number 308, Thine Be the Glory. We'll sing stanzas one and two. remain standing as we share our faith together through the Apostles' Creed. Let's unite in this historic confession of our Christian faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead, He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
¿no? Let's have a time of prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for every good blessing, and we thank you for these children that bring such wonderful music to us. But we thank you for your power and spirit that put this music in our lives and give us reasons to sing. We thank you for your Son, Jesus the Christ, who came to live, to teach, to show, to guide us into new life. We thank you for his love that, that lifts our praises, that it empowers all of our singing and all of our worship. We thank you that we are here today as part of this service. As we gather, we do think of those who are not with us. We have friends who are just out of the hospital and friends who are in the middle of treatments, waiting the next chemo treatment. We have friends who are recovering from surgery and friends who are, who've lost loved ones in recent days. We have friends who are worried about their school, worried about job, worried about something. Be their peace, be their power, be their hope. Let your spirit descend upon all of us that we might have what we need to get through the days that are coming. Help us to find strength. Help us to find wisdom. But in all things, help us to know your presence in our lives, that you never forsake us, that you never neglect us, but you are always, always there. We pray these things in the name of the one you sent, Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now it's time for our children. I'm glad to see you all. Some of you are 8.30 people and we missed you early this morning. So it's great to have you. Let's get a few, I want you to see, I brought a stuffed animal with me. Come on down guys. Will you have a penguin too? Come on up. I, wanted, I want you to, this, this stuffed animal, my son, who is 25, Bought at the yard sale yesterday. Do you know what this is? It's a dog. No. A bear. It's a bear. What kind of bear? A black bear. A black bear. Does a it? Bear. Does it seem strange that a black bear is in Starkville? Do you know? Does anybody know who the mascot? Who the black bear is the mascot for? Who? Ole Miss. That's right. Oh, Miss. That's like Mississippi State's rival. So what would I be doing with a black bear? I don't exactly know why he bought it, but, but he did. You know, the people from Ole Miss and Mississippi State, a lot of times act like we don't like each other, especially certain weekends of the fall or when we're playing basketball or football. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of rivalry, and we may say we don't like people from Ole Miss, and people in Oxford may say the same thing about us. I don't, I don't know. But generally, Mississippi State people and Ole Miss people don't agree on certain things. Would you say that's true? And, and, and maybe don't like to be around each other sometimes. Would you say that's true? Yeah. But, you know, I have some friends and even some family that went to Ole Miss, and I love them. I don't quite understand their choice of a school, but I, but I still love them. You know, back in Bible times, there were groups of people that didn't want to have anything to do with each other. The Jews and the Gentiles... The Jewish people didn't want to have anything to do with the Gentiles. In fact, it was against their laws to associate with them, to go into their house. Now, the Jews didn't even think that the Gentiles should hear the good news of Jesus. But God made it very clear. You'll listen, Brother Giles is going to read a story in just a minute. God made it very clear that he wanted all people everywhere to hear the good news about Jesus. Not just in Bible times, but today. Now, what that means for us is, 
Sure, there are a lot of people that we're with every day and we see all the time, but we need to, in everything that we say and in everything that we do, we need to show other people God's love. It doesn't matter if it's people we know, people we hang with, people we go to school with, whoever it is, everything we do and say needs to show that we love God, to share God's love with other people, to share the good news of Jesus. And I want to challenge you this week to do that. Find a way to share God's love with somebody else. Let's pray. Dear God, we do love you so much, and we just can't even understand how much you love us, but we thank you for that love. God, help that love spill out of us and onto other people everywhere. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. Our hymn is number 141, Children of the Heavenly Father. We'll stand together and sing the first and last verses, number 141. We bring them in thanksgiving. We bring them to your glory. We bring them in the name of the Christ. Amen. You may be seated.
We're in the 10th chapter of Acts. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day, about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who called to him and said, Cornelius, what is it, Lord? The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up to the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of this vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. We'll finish this story in just a minute. But this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
thank Cindy and the kids and all of our helpers and all of our instrumentalists. That we do have a wonderful, wonderful children's program and wonderful children's music program. Southern Christians of every denomination love the 10th chapter of the book of Acts. It's one of the most important parts of Scripture for them and for us. Our world would not be the same if we did not have the 10th chapter of Acts. Now, I've got you thinking because Acts 10 doesn't just jump out at you like the 9th chapter of Acts and Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus or the 2nd chapter of Luke with the Christmas story or the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. In fact, even when I read a portion of Acts 10 for you a few minutes ago, some of y'all probably still didn't ring a bell. That's not a story. It's kind of a weird story with this centurion and this sheet out of heaven. And not everybody quite understands it. But stop and think about where we would be if we did not have that passage. Because your Bible says back in Leviticus in the 11th chapter, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, say to the Israelites, of all the animals that live on land, these are the ones you may eat. You may eat any animal that has divided hoof and choose the cud. We've got a lot of animal husbandry people here. They understand what that means. There are some that only chew the cud or only have a divided hoof. You must not eat them. And then they go on and give examples that you're not supposed to eat camels. Well, that's not a big problem with us. Uh, or rabbits, well, you know, maybe or maybe not. But then they go and stop preaching and go to meddling. And the pig, though it has a divided hoof, does not chew the cud. It is unclean from you. You must not eat their meat or touch their carcasses. They are unclean for you. Now, stop and think about that. No bacon. No ham sandwiches. No ribs, at least not the right type of ribs. No pulled pork. No football. <laughs> Actually, I have done further research, and you, you'll, be, you'll be pleased to know that in current day, no pig skin or other parts of pigs are used in football, so we probably would be safe on that one. However, you have to say, the Bible does not speak well anywhere, not just in Leviticus, of eating barbecue pork sandwiches. Of course, it does get worse. You continue on in the 11th chapter of Leviticus. Of all the creatures living in the water of the seas and the streams that you may, you may eat any that have fins and scales. But all the creatures in the seas and streams that do not have fins and scales, whether among the swarming things or among the other living creatures in the water, you are to regard them as unclean. And since you regard them as unclean, you must not eat their meat. You must regard their carcasses as unclean. Anything living in water that does not have fins and scales is to be regarded as unclean by you. You understand what that means? No crawfish. No crabs. No shrimp. There go, to duck, there go to gumbo. You know, it's just not, not going to happen. And then it even kind of gets worse than that. No catfish, because catfish have fins but no scales. Now that's kind of a, 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 truther, a southern trifecta there. You take away barbecued pork, shrimp po' boys, and fried catfish, I'm not sure what else we're going to eat. <laughs> and it, it actually gets worse than that, because I don't have time to go into this one, because this one comes from another part of the Bible over in, in Exodus and Deuteronomy. But there's a passage in there that the rabbis interpret as saying that you cannot mix your meat with your milk products, which means, of course, not just no cheeseburgers, but no fried chicken. They didn't get that early. I'm not coming to your house to eat fried chicken. You obviously don't know how to cook fried chicken right. You've got to dip fried chicken in buttermilk to make it right. All right. Got that clear. We won't go down that one today. However, I dare say that despite these very clear biblical admonitions against 
eating these things, I am pretty sure that everyone in this room over the age of three has violated one or more or many of these laws at one time or another. I've got Facebook pictures of some of y'all holding crawfish. But so, uh, and we do it willingly. We do it deliberately. We do it knowingly. And one of the excuses we use for this as we wipe the barbecue sauce or cocktail sauce off our lips is this vision that Peter has in the 10th chapter of Acts. Now the vision is kind of strange and even, even Peter has a hard time understanding it. Peter's up on his roof praying. He's hungry. It's, it's about lunchtime. So he is ready to eat. He's thinking about food. And maybe that's why he has this vision of food. He sees this huge sheep with all sorts of animals on it, lowered down from heaven. And a voice says to him, Peter, take, kill, and eat whatever's on this sheet. And Peter is a good Jewish boy, and he knows what he's allowed to eat and what he's not allowed to eat. And he says, Lord, I have never eaten anything unclean. I've never eaten anything impure. You don't even let <coughs> those animals touch the things that you are going to eat. And so obviously it doesn't say specifically but there must have been some pigs or some lobsters or some crabs or something on, the, on this sheet that he knew he was not allowed to eat. But God answers back, Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And for emphasis, this is repeated three times. Well, Peter is still scratching his head trying to figure out what all this means when these men sent by Cornelius arrive at his door. Now you remember from the scripture lesson, Cornelius is a Roman centurion. He is from Italy. He believes in God. He prays to God. He is one of those people they call God fears. He's not a Jew. He's not a Christian, but there were people in that place and time who looked at all the Roman and Greek gods and all those mystery religions they had and then looked at the one God of the Jews and realized that there was something to this Jewish faith, that there was something that was more holy, more sacred, more, more moral, more right than all this confusion of gods and, and goddesses that they had among the Greeks. He was one of those people. He's not a Jew. He's not a Christian. But he's seeking the truth. And he's seeking the one true God. And he prays to that God every day. And so God sends an angel to Cornelius and tells him that his prayers have been heard. His kindness has been seen by God. And he needs to send for this Simon named Peter. And Simon Peter will tell him what he needs to know. Simon Peter will bring him the truth. So these guys appear at Simon's door. And, and I'm sure Peter's a little nervous to have a Roman soldier come knocking at your door. That's not, that's not usually a good sign. But the Holy Spirit prompts him that something as good is going to happen. He needs to go with these men. He needs to go and bring this message. So they go to the house of Cornelius. And they get there, and even there, Peter's a little hesitant about going inside. Because in that day, in that time, in that culture, you just didn't go into a Gentile's house. It would make you ritually unclean. It just, it just wasn't right. But remembering these things, remembering what he had just experienced, Peter goes in. He, he remembers that, that God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. And so he goes in the house. And Cornelius has a lot of friends and family there. And these are, again, they're not Christians. They're not Jews. They're, they're, they're his, his Roman friends. And so Peter, mixing what he already knows with what he just discovered, begins to preach. He starts off this way. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and who does what is right. And he goes on to tell them about Jesus. And he tells them about the cross and the resurrection. And he tells them about forgiveness. And before he could even get to the end of his sermon, before he could have an altar call and start singing, Just As I Am, the Holy Spirit comes upon them. They start praising God in all sorts of languages. It, it's, it's like what happened to Peter and his friends at Pentecost. And it's so powerful and it's so exciting that some people call this the Gentile Pentecost. And Peter is just amazed. He's seen God do some wonderful things, but nothing like this. 
He hadn't even gotten to the end. He hadn't even gotten to the, the punchline of the message. And there they are, praising God. Peter had brought some Jewish Christians with him, and they couldn't believe what they were seeing. And Peter could hardly believe what he was seeing. But there it was. And so he baptized them right then and right there. I mean, you have to remember, at this point in the story, Christianity is pretty much a Jewish denomination. All the early Christians were Jews. Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. And we haven't started spreading out to the rest of the world yet. And some of the early Jewish Christians still kept to themselves. They kind of kept a, a separation. They kept their own customs. They kept their own identity. And they saw the whole rest of the world as outsiders. The whole rest of the world, including most of our ancestors, they saw as Gentiles. Now these customs, they seem strange to us today. We don't know all the reasons behind the food laws that were in the Old Testament. Some of them have origins in, in hygiene and food safety. Some of them come about because other cultures sacrificed their animals and ate certain things in certain ways and the Jews did not want to do it like they did. Some of it is just a way of saying, we're different. We are set apart. We are separate. We are a chosen people. But the problem is, by the time of Jesus and the early church, that fence of separation that had been so important to the Jewish people in maintaining their identity, in maintaining their survival throughout the years, that that fence had become a wall, a wall separating them from all the rest of humanity. And though they were the chosen people, and they were an important part of God's plan, of God's story, of how Jesus was going to come into the world, they needed to understand that now God was calling all nations, all peoples, even the, the, the pagan, heathen, unclean Gentiles. Well, not everyone, not all the early Christians could understand that. They, they, did, they just, it was so much different from what they'd grown up with. And when some heard that Peter had done this, they criticized him. And it's interesting, they don't criticize him for preaching to the Gentiles. They don't criticize him for baptizing the Gentiles. They said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. That was still the bigger offense. That was what they just couldn't get their minds around and get past. But then G Peter tells them the story of what happens. He tells them the whole story about the sheep coming down in the vision and Cornelius and the Holy Spirit and all that had happened. And then <clears throat> Peter says a wonderful line. So if God gave them the same gift He gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? If God was going to pour His Holy Spirit out on these people, I wasn't going to get it in the way. And His friends are still, you can still see them shaking their head. They still don't quite get it. I mean, it's even in their words, they said, So then... Even to the Gentiles, you can, you can just hear it there. Even to the Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. That's the good news. Most interpreters of the Bible believe that Peter's vision with the sheep and the animals is more about people than it is about food. They believe that for the church to fulfill Jesus' command to take the gospel to Jerusalem first and then Judea and Samaria and then to all the world, to the ends of the earth, that the church would have to get beyond the, the Jewish cultural roots, that some people, that saw some people, some whole groups of people as being unclean, unacceptable, unworthy of God's love. So this vision was necessary, this story is necessary, this lesson for Peter was so necessary to get them out of their, their own little circle and see that they were to carry the good news of Jesus Christ to every nation, to every people, that God was out to save the whole world. And of course, that lesson doesn't just have to apply 2,000 years ago. We, we still today sometimes have to overcome our own prides and our own prejudices that separate us from people if we're going to witness to the good news of Jesus Christ in our day, in our time. As I said, most people who read the 10th chapter of Acts realize it's mostly about people. But they also realize that what it said about the food is real. 
while it's about God's love for all people and how we should love each other, the food stuff is just a, another blessing, another bonus. Yes, we're supposed to love everybody, but also we can eat jambalaya and shrimp po' boys and pulled pork sandwiches. That's just further proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. I've had a little fun with this sermon. Had, I've had fun with this sermon all week. I, people shouldn't enjoy their work as much as I do. Uh, not to mention getting awful hungry. But the truth is, the food side of this story and the people side of this story have more of a connection than most people realize, than you might see at first glance. Because how can you talk to somebody Talk about the ball game. Talk about life. Talk about a God who loves all people. Talk about a Jesus Christ who died for every person in the world. How can you talk about that with somebody if you can't even sit down with them? If you can't even look at them over the table? The stuff about food in this story is about breaking down the barriers that separate us from knowing, from caring, from talking to, from witnessing to, from eating with another person. It's not saying that a culture or a society or a religion can't have its own rules, its own customs, its own disciplines, but if we allow those things to build such walls between us and other people that we can't even talk to them, then how are we going to witness? How are we going to share the good news? In that day and time, sitting down at a table with somebody was very, very important. It was an act of community. It was an act of hospitality. It was an act of respect. And removing those food barriers that kept the Jew and the Gentile from sitting down together, that was the beginning of conversation. It was the beginning of witness and the beginning of bringing salvation to all nations. Question is, what walls have we built today? In what way do we allow ourselves to see someone else as unclean, unworthy of God's love? In what ways do we need to be reminded not to call impure anyone that God has made clean, anyone who is loved by God, anyone for whom Christ has died. That's the lesson we need to take from this story. The pulled pork sandwiches and the, and the bacon, lettuce, tomato sandwiches, that's just a bonus. This is the lesson for us, that we have to see the world as people loved by God. And we have to see it in such a way that we can carry the good news that we have to them. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your good news. We thank you for every way in which you bless our lives, but we thank you that we have a story to tell. We thank you for helping us to break down the barriers so that we can tell that story and share that good news with your whole world. We do this in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. I need to remind those who are a part of the Messengers Youth Choir that you will meet for rehearsal this afternoon at 5 o'clock in the regular spot at 5 o'clock this afternoon. Our hymn is number 547. We'll stand and sing verses 1 and 3.
always proud of our young people for leading us and for all that they bring to us. Thank you all for being part of this service today. Now may you go in peace on the love of God your Father, grace to His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the power and the comfort of the Holy Spirit go with you.